and I'm just kind of the other way. Let me see how much I can break so I can figure out how to put it back together. Hello, and welcome back to the Art Infused Life podcast. This is Lynn Matsalini, and I'm here with my co-host, Don Beauvais, and our guest, Kira McCoy, today. Super excited to have you on, Kira. Would you want to start us off with a little background about you? Sure. Ah. <laughs> Hi, ladies. It's really great to be sitting with you today. I'm glad that we all met. Um, I grew up in an artsy and intellectual family, so... Um, I'd say like half my family is in white collar type work and the other half is in, um, you know, teaching and arts and music. So I had a really well-rounded early childhood with all of that. And then when I was going to go to college, it became the question, like, should I be a biology teacher like my dad? Should I be an art teacher like my mother? And I picked art because it sounded more fun. So <laughs> I grew up. I didn't grow to regret that because I didn't get my actual art teaching position until I was 35. Um, and I did a lot of odd job type stuff. I worked in marketing departments. I used my artistic skills to do things, but I, I couldn't get into teaching until much you know, later after I graduated. And um, all in 2007, I started my own podcast about the art of polymer clay, which is... Um, something that you may be familiar with, like Sculpey and making little things that you can bake in the oven. And the reason I got involved with that craft is because when I was in school, I was a potter and I was using a potter's wheel and doing ceramics, which is a really big labor intensive type of craft. And I moved a lot. So I was looking for something more portable. I had a lot of wanderlust. I lived all over the country. I think I've had 39 addresses since I graduated from college. <laughs> so wow. I, have, I, I kind of call that my working vacation. <laughs> and I kind of moved every <laughs> year or two and experienced a lot of things. And I love it because I have friends now all over the country. And I've experienced a lot of different um, living, you know, just kind of walking through America. Um and then when I got my teaching position, it was actually because of my podcast. So I was working in the marketing department of a big um, construction company in West Palm Beach, and I was still trying to get into a school. And I had been podcasting for a few years, and I came across a listing in the Broward County School Board that said they were looking for a certified teacher, which I was, um, who had podcast and video experience and who knew Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator. And I was like, oh, they wrote this job description for me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> who else has all these skills? And I called them and it was like 10 in the morning and they said, can you come down here at lunch? And I said, I need a long lunch break today. <laughs> and I went, interviewed and got the job and quit two weeks later and started podcasting for the school board. Oh, wow. That is incredible. Yeah. I never knew that you were a potter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I took a little bit of pottery and I took a little bit of pottery in college, but I just want our listeners to know that we know Kira because she is in the badass art tribe with us and she's actually a, an administrator of that um, group, which I envy because and Lynn is going to kick me for saying this, but, you know, tech is something that I fear. Yeah. And I know that, I know, Kira, you, you love the techie mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, you uh -huh. thrive with it. So um, I'm really interested to hear um, some of that part mm -hmm. of your story, too, because how did you get so smart <laughs> at it? How did you learn it? Um all mm -hmm. the things. Well, I mean, to me, uh, I really love to adopt technology. I don't know what that is inside of me, but I really like to adopt things early. Um, so I think that, that, that the tech part is just natural talent. Like my, my younger brother runs an IT department for a very famous company that you would know if I said it. Um, and he doesn't, he didn't even go to college. So it's that part of it. My grandfather and his grandfather were all, were all engineers. So I think that 
I'm blessed to have that sort of creative double side of the brain thing working. Um, cause a lot of creatives do have a harder time with like the more technical stuff. So, um, I really consider that a blessing that I, I have like the logic and the creativity and I can use them together. Um, so, and I, I'm just not afraid of it. You know, that's part of it. I know a lot of people just kind of feel like technology can break if they mess with it. And I'm just kind of the other way. Let me see how much I can break so I can figure out how to put it back together. So my podcast started because I met someone on Etsy in 2006 who wanted to start a little online guild for polymer clay. And she had just gotten a little, you know, the nano iPods that were like a brick of soap <laughs> with a tiny yes. little video. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we were in this guild together and she said, I, I think I want to make a podcast. I just got an iPod. This is really cool. Kira, again, I was making the website for the guild and she was like, Kira, do you want to do a podcast? And I was like, sure, let's do it. What's a podcast? You know, <laughs> so <laughs> I kind of had that like fail forward mentality where um, people ask me to do things and I say yes. And then I, I build the plane as it's going down. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I learned, you know, back then in, in 06 and 07, um, YouTube was just getting started and we were actually filming this video podcast thing on the big shoulder cams that had actual videotape that you had to rewind. And, you know, it wasn't like today it was rewind. You you know, had one it, of those. <laughs> it was pretty bad. So <laughs> it was difficult. And doing a podcast like this with audio was also difficult, you know, like just having to learn how to do all those things. Um, it was just something that I bootstrapped and figured out and it just came easy to me. I mean, when I was in, um, college in 1991 through 95, I w I wrote my papers on one of those typewriter things where you could see four words at a time. They called it a word processor, but you know, <laughs> It was more yeah. like a suitcase with buttons on it. Um, yep. <laughs> where you had to type, yep. you know, you had to type on actual paper. <laughs> so, um, you know, yeah. and I just kind of went with it every time there was a new, a new thing that I could do. I just tried it, and you know, now I'm full Apple. I mean, I think I have every piece of Apple equipment that you can get. Um, and I love it. You know, I love that my stuff talks to each other and I always figure out new ways of doing it. And I often innovate. So <clears throat> I like to come up with new things because I like my processes to be easier and faster. And I, I hate to waste time because there's so much to do, right? So for me, wasting time on something that I could do easier, um, I just try to innovate a process to make it easier. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm mm -hmm. the same way, but for me, wasting time is trying to do it myself when somebody else can do it for me a heck of a lot faster. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. And that's, a, I mean, that's a viable way of getting things done too. And that's why it's great to know people who have different skills, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you can't do everything yourself. Um, but I definitely do try to do a lot of things mm -hmm. myself. And I think before a person outsources, I think they really need to know how to do it themselves so that, you know, they know what it takes to get the job done right and, and yeah. correctly. But yeah, that's, that's so amazing. I didn't have any idea that polymer clay existed in 2006. <laughs> I think I just heard about it you know, kind of post 2020, although I was kind of in a time warp of, you know, focused on um, all things mm -hmm. chemistry. Um, going to Michael's was a big treat that I did not allow myself to have uh -huh. very often for a lot of years. Um, and I've seen some of your videos, um, the create along um, with Polymer mm -hmm. Clay TV, which is amazing. Do you want to talk to us sure. about that and how you got yeah. the channel? started and mm -hmm. what you're doing now. Yeah. So that was in 2007 that started and that was me and Elisa, my former business partner started that as like a podcast one week 
and then a video cast the next. And we just kind of alternated back and forth and we never lived near each other. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I would go to her house and we'd film 12 of them in a row over a weekend and get very tired, silly, Oh wow! <laughs> you know, and then we'd have content for six months. Hi, I'm Elise Beer, and I'm Kira Sly, and you are watching episode one of Polymer Clay TV. Since then, I've had a name change, and sometimes I put on this wig and use our brand colors to create this fun persona for quick tips. Here, I've imported video from my Facebook group, and totally improved my top-down video production so that people can really see what I'm doing. I love teaching this way. Um, and then eventually we opened a, an online classroom that was in 2013 we wrote a book and that was a bestseller, Polymer Clay Art Jewelry. And, um, and then in 2014 I said, you know, we've been interviewing people on our podcast and we know everybody in Polymer Clay. What if we called them all up and said, do you want to collaborate and do a classroom and teach one class and we'll get everybody all over the world to come and join us and it'll be a lot of fun. And because I knew I could do it with Google Docs and, you know, like Dropbox and just having everybody give me all their stuff and I could perform the technological, you know, magic in the back end and make it happen. And 24 people said yes. And we opened Polymer Clay Adventure in 2015, and 1,200 people joined. So we went from, like, we had wow. a 1,200-person launch, and we went from making nothing, because we were not selling anything, to having this multiple six-figure classroom in, like, a month. Um, you know, and I say a month, but I mean se seven months of building an audience. <laughs> and then we offered them something, and they wanted it which is amazing and wonderful. And that I, you know, I hope that that happens for everyone who does the audience building when you connect with people and then you launch something and everybody wants it, right? So after we had those people in the classroom, then um, they were asking, what else do you have? So I said, well, I like to draw. So how can I turn my drawings into a tool? And I started making silk screens that were like, you know, four by five inches for people to use on their clay to make a pattern. And I actually drew, I had a job this whole time. And at the time I wasn't teaching, I was working in an office and I had doodled something on the back of one of those little whiteboard card things with a felt tip pen, you know, and I went into yeah. the break room and mm. I took a photo of it with my phone and I brought it into illustrator to clean it up. And then I sent it off to someone who was doing Gakko print um, silk screening, which was is a technology that doesn't happen anymore. But um, it was a really cool thing. And I saw she was doing it for fabric. So I sent my drawing to her and said, can you just make me one? I want to try it out. And she did. And then I put it on the clay. And I said, I think I invented something new here. Because silk screens... Mm require a photo emulsion and you have to burn it with light and then you have to, you know, clean them with a hose. And I was like, I am not, I'm looking forward to selling thousands of these and I'm not going to stand outside with a hose all day making silk screen. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. so how can I do this differently? And the Gakko printing technique was something that worked for a while until they discontinued the materials worldwide and we couldn't get them anymore to innovate mm. again, um, which is how I do my current process. And I just, I just kind of never took no for an answer. So when we started selling product, it was silk screens. And then we were doing, um, rubber stamps made out of silicone, um, that you pour like a two part silicone that you would use to make a mold with, but I make my stamps out of it. And again, innovated in a different way. Um, which I'm not going to talk about because it's my trade secret. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, but I just kept thinking like, how can I do it differently so that I can do it fast and make a quality thing? And people loved it. So we just kind of added more things to the product line. And now I have one employee who, um, she, I call her my mistress of manufacture. 
and she runs all of the equipment and she's amazing and awesome and I love her. Her name is Shannon and my business partner retired. So it's all me and, and Shannon making this stuff. So, you know, I work on the design and I work on the, the video part of it and the teaching and we run a Facebook group with 23,000 people and, um, it's just really cool. You know, the polymer clay tribe is my group and you can find them on Facebook. So, you know, people love to make all kinds of things with clay. Earrings are a huge craze right now. That's kind of going through the world. But before that it was fairy doors. And I like to, I always like to put it on canvas and make sculptures. So, um, they're just, there's just a lot of different things you can do with it. I like that it's dimensional, so I will often make something and stick it on a canvas and then paint into it or over it or whatever to make art. Right. I love the dimensional aspect of art. I love the thick mm -hmm. and chunky paint and the multiple layers and, you know, not knowing what's underneath, um, you know, Part of the thing that I've always liked to do is infuse like mm -hmm. a secret message to the artwork, whether it be underneath, whether it be a strip of paper that you have written a message on and tear it and put a little bit of piece of that on the art. But um, I'm fascinated by the polymer um, and I have actually just started watching a couple mm -hmm. YouTube videos about that, how to infuse that onto the canvases. But I love the fact that you're so inventive and, you know, not staying stuck in one particular thing. Okay, so the process went away. There's many people that would have said, oh, wow, that's it. I'm done. But you know, you said that that process had mm -hmm. been eliminated, but yet you persevered and you just kept going and you didn't know what was gonna be coming down the pike, but eventually it came to you. So I, I really want you to elaborate on that like okay. we were talking. Um, so I was using this printing process and it required these rolls of film. And we got a notification from the manufacturer they were going to be discontinued. So I said, okay, how many do you have? And I bought almost all of their stock, which was like eight rolls left. And I just said, okay, I have eight rolls to figure it out because this is my best selling product. I'm not just going to quit. You know, this was becoming my livelihood at that point. And you know, the joke of I was working a full-time job and doing this and I was getting ready to quit my full-time job so I could work 24 seven for myself. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and in that process, you work 80 hours a week. And I was like, I'm not, it's just not giving that up. So, um, so then what I did is I, because I knew I wanted to innovate, right. I did not want to go do photo process, photo emulsion, silk screens. And this is a silk screen. You know, this is typical of what my company creates. So I, um, mm -hmm. the creative process for me tends to be going out and finding things I don't already know about. So I went to a trade show and I'm familiar with trade shows because I always went to them for art materials or polymer clay. Um, the CHA, which is Creative Hobby Association, is one that I've been to many times. NAMTA is the um, North American Art Materials trade association or something like that. And so I've been to those, but in Orlando, because I also live in Florida, I live in Jacksonville and in Orlando, which is only a two hour drive, they have the convention center and all kinds of things come to that. So I went to an apparel and textiles trade show just to walk the floor and see what was there. And I met a guy who was making something interesting. They were like little stickers and they had a, um, heat sensitive back, like you would heat press them. And I brought some home, didn't really know what I was going to do with them. Aside from, I thought maybe I would put them on polymer clay and bake it and make like a clay sticker, but it turned out to not work the way I thought it would. So it was just sitting on my table one night 
And so was my little quilting iron, you know, the little tiny ones. So I had one of those sitting on my table and I had some organza fabric from something I had been doing and they were all laying out there. And a, and a spark of an idea started, so I turned on my little quilting iron and then I stuck the sticker fabric on the organza and then I said, I just made a silk screen, <laughs> right? So it happened really quick and then once I figured out how to use that sticker fabric, um, you know, I was able to make all of my designs really detailed using, uh, just the heat pressing method. And my business took off from there because I could make them fast and I could make them nice. And my screens are like thick and they will last your whole lifetime if you use them properly. So, and Lynn, you had asked about like the difference, you know, why a silk screen rather than a stencil? So um, I have mm -hmm. each of those products here and stencils are, they require a different type of design because you're making holes in this plastic material. And if you don't do it right, the whole thing falls apart. So the constraints of this drawing style are a lot like more specific than being able to draw anything you want and transfer it to a piece of fabric. So the silkscreen design can be way more intricate and detailed and you can put words on it and you don't have to worry about the same things as with a stencil. Although we do use both. Mm. Wow. That is so cool. That, um, do, do people who do mixed media art, like not polymer clay stuff, but just, I don't know, uh, stuff with paint, do they use your products? They because could. Um, it could work. The, the silk screen, uh, the very first silk screen I got from that woman, the first thing I did with it was actually transfer the design with paint onto my journal cover, which was a paper journal. So mm -hmm. it works really well with paper, but people, it's, it's an interesting like craft with polymer clay because all the tools we have work with all kinds of mixed media, but people don't know that until they kind of try it. Um, and it can be more mm. difficult, like a silk screen like this will stick to the polymer clay because the clay is tacky. So sticking it down to a canvas or a paper might require either taping across the top of it to hold it still because you only do one pass, you know, or they make that, um, like basting spray that you can use for quilting or sewing to hold the thing down for a minute. It's removable and that re works really well with this as well. You just like give it a little spray and do the repositionable tack thing to get it to stick where you want it. So yeah, I mean, they do work mm -hmm. for multiple crafts. And the other thing that I make a lot of is rubber stamps, which obviously comes from paper and ceramic and, you know, all the things are transferable. I mean, I paint I, and I, I, really like to make things. So like, for example, behind me, grab this. She's sm too small to see unless I hold her up, but I like to make things. So this is a little holder that's on my desk and she's made of polymer and paint and she has little feet and she's actually based on a little mini, like a one pint paint can. So, you know, I like to make art objects and the clay allows me to do that because it's not just a painting that goes on the wall. It's like you can make things with it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And so you probably do a lot of outsourcing of some of those silk screens now. Or no, we make them all. all. We make all clients. of our products in house. We have mm. a fleet of 3D printers, which make our cutters and some of our stamps. And we have a fleet of other, you know, materials and, and equipment and machines to make all of our stuff. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. I don't know if uh, my sound was mm -hmm. working when you talked about using the polymer mm -hmm. clay on canvas for yeah. textured paintings, but um, I love the ooey gooey stuff. And so 
I'm really interested to hear about mm -hmm. that process. So polymer clay mm -hmm. has to be baked in the oven. So there's two ways to do it. You can either, and this is the way that I do most of it, you can make your sculpture and then bake it flat or however you want it. And then once it's baked, you know, it's pretty lightweight. So you can use a impasto medium or a gel medium to stick it into the canvas. A lot of times I'll cut um, niches into the canvas and stick something behind it and then stick clay in it. Um, one of my colleagues and a uh, teacher in one of the former polymer clay adventures, Tristina, she, um, she and I are Pebeo specialists. So I'm also a Pebeo paint specialist. And um, oh. the, she made a, thing, a, a piece of art where it was little cups of polymer clay. They were made into little pinch pot cup type things. And then she put them, like submerged them in resin and filled them with more paint. So it was like a very sculptural painting with a lot of movement. And that's why I love it, you know? And, and there's a type of Sculpey clay um, called ultra light. And it's, it's obviously very light but it also has a tooth. So it's great for mixed media mm -hmm. because you can paint right over it with gesso and it accepts whatever, you know, it's easy to glue onto a painting. It doesn't really add any weight to it. So creating it and baking it is like step one and then just sticking it in the canvas and painting around it or over it or sticking more things in it. You can drill into it, it, it accepts glue. It's like the ultimate mixed media sculpture compound. <laughs> I am just, my brain mm -hmm. is spinning right now. <laughs> Mine too. So, I'm so intrigued with this. I'm just like, oh my gosh, this has opened up a mm -hmm. whole new doorway for me. I'm glad, I'm glad you should try wow. it. Get yourself some Sculpey Ultralight. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna work, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> because of you. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, one of my artist friends is doing a lot of things like with tiles and especially mm -hmm. like mirror tiles in some of her portraits, and they look awesome. But I, I was thinking, um, I was thinking to mention to her mm -hmm. about polymer clay. I don't know if there's any kind of re highly reflective um, process, but I was thinking then because earrings seem like not easy, but you know, at least it's like a small project. And so I like to make portraits. And so I was thinking, Oh, wouldn't that be cool? Like just mm -hmm. to add like an earring on the. Yeah, on the absolutely. In fact, one so, of the artists that, um, and this is what I love about like the collaborative nature of, of worldwide, um, internet connection now. So one of the people that I mm -hmm. sometimes work with is an illustrator and a pattern designer from India. And when I was doing more mm. earring things, I, she actually drew um, like advertising materials for us that had pictures of women and she would uh, add the earrings into them to make them look like they were wearing the earrings. You know, so it was like a cartoon mm. woman wearing an actual earring. So really cool stuff. Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> so you could take it a step further and have really your painting nice. wear an earring take a, the girl with the pearl into a whole new direction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. I might just do that. Thank you. I'm actually visualizing your painting like mm -hmm. that, Lynn. I can see it. Oh, wow. Well, then I have to make it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. yeah. So Kira, can you tell us about your creative process? Because um, I know you talked a lot about having the left brain kind of, you know, technical, you know, interest and logic, and then you have this creative side. And I'm, I know that the more time you spend with creativity, like the more it comes, but you know, it, if you've ever had a dry spell, like how do you get yourself out of that dry spell? Like, how do you be, how do you make this uh, magic happen where you're so <laughs> inventive? A lot of experiences. Um, you know, I'm a Gemini and I don't know if you know any of the jokes about mm -hmm. being a Gemini, but I am an information hog. So if I get interested in something, it's intense. You know, it means I'm going to read every blog on it 
I'm going to go check out 15 books from the library in one weekend. Yeah, and I'm going to learn everything I can about it until I feel whole and complete and move on to the next topic. And then because I've done that with so many different things, mm -hmm. my brain can just make connections. So my, my um, creative process would be like thinking about what I want, which is usually to make a gift or to make something for the house or to just kind of come up with something new and then sort of leave it alone. I'm not a sketcher. I don't keep a lot of, um, you know, like I don't sketch things out first. My brain sketches it out while I'm staring off into space. Hmm. But I do like to make lists. So I think that maybe my, my process is more verbal or more linguistic. So I'll make an exhaustive list for three pages in my journal. And then things will start hmm. coming to me. So nice. as a creative artist, it's not like I don't have the Leonardo sketchbooks. I just have journals. Oh, full okay, of notes. cool. And then this reminds me of your contribution to the creative life book. And then downtime and walking because and you driving have my a car or taking a shower is when I get my best ideas. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited because I got my paperback copy. Uh, <laughs> yay. I'm also excited because 23 is my favorite number. And like ever, it was my favorite year. Uh, when I was young, it was, it's my birthday, it's May 23rd. <laughs> so of course, I, when we wrote our chapters for this book, we weren't told kind of where in the book we would be. But magically, my chapter is 23. <laughs> So <laughs> I talked about daily habits supporting a creative life. And I really feel like a lot of times people think that they have to do big, massive up levels and big moves in their life. Like people tell you that, you know, leaping is what brings you to your next level. And I, it's not that I disagree because sometimes you do need to leap, but I also think that those daily rituals, mm -hmm. the, the things you do every day, really define what you're committed to and how you're going to move forward. So it's like the little, tiny, almost minuscule things that you do every day really turn you into who you are. So I talked about being more intentional about that. And I also believe that it's really not mm -hmm. about the destination. It's all mm -hmm. about the journey. So if I can find joy in the uh, little boring tasks or whatever that I'm doing every single day and make habits or rituals out of that and find joy in that, like my journey yeah. is going to be full. Um, I listen to these podcasts about, you know, mm -hmm. making money, making money that that's, it's great to make money. And of course mm -hmm. we all want to make money. Right. But that's yeah. not the journey. The journey mm -hmm. is in the doing you hear all these people mm -hmm. that won the lottery. Right. And, and then you hear mm -hmm. all the tragic <laughs> stories. Have, yeah. have happened afterwards because it's not about that. It's about, it, yeah, it's about the daily the things. It's about, you know, and ritual. I like to use that word because 45% of mm -hmm. everything you do is ritualized behavior. Because if you had to think about how to get dressed, how to tie your shoes, how to make a cup of coffee. I mean, if you had to relearn that every day, mm -hmm and figure out what your process was going to be, you wouldn't have time for anything else. So your brain does like ritual. But my question is, do your rituals support you or not? So, <laughs> yeah. Point. Key element, yeah. yes. Is it moving you mm -hmm. in the direction that you want to be? Is it, like, I like this saying, it's in my recovery program. Uh, am I trudging the mm -hmm. road of happy destiny? Is that what I'm doing? Because if I'm not, that ritual or that 
habit or whatever yeah. you want to call it. And then it's going. a, you know, we do carve those rituals deep. So then it's just being intentional about which, you know, where you want to veer off that path and make a new one. So, you know, if you're, I mean, that's the first step. If you're not and, where uh, you think you want it to going? be, then you have to just Here evaluate. <laughs> Am I even going in the direction that I thought I wanted to go? Sometimes we go in a direction because it's what people expect from us. Sometimes we go in a direction because it's what we always did, you know? So intention is like 50% of the game. And it's not even the goal. It's just the intention of where you think you want to go. Yeah. <laughs> where am I going? <laughs> I, I mean, I love that I was in this book and I want that to take me just to meet more people. Um, I was on the little uh, crafter's corner on Jacksonville's um, River City Live TV program a couple months ago, and I'd like to talk to them about creativity. So, you know, we'll see if I can come back on the show. And I love talking to people. I love helping people with their creative issues. My favorite thing in the world is collaboration, as you two both know from the work that we do in the High Vibe Art Tribe. Um, and, you know, based on how my whole income producing part of my <laughs> company started was just this idea that I had to bring people together to collaborate because I really believe that empowered women empower women. And, you know, being with mm -hmm. empowered women is important to me. So I don't know where I'm going. I just know that I have this nice creative company called create along because my youtube videos always end with now come create along with me you know so when that domain name was available i was shocked i'm like nobody's taking this this is mine <laughs> you know create along create along with me so i invite people to create along and i love to teach and i love yeah. to um encourage you know that creativity isn't just about art it's about how you live your life. It's about how you put ideas together. Yeah. Because really, there's nothing really very new under the sun. It's just how your brain puts different things together and creates something that hasn't been seen before. Out yeah. of stuff that's already existing. Because, you know, matter just transmutes into one thing into a paint, transmutes into a painting. It's not like we have to reinvent paint every time. It's just how's it going to come out of your hands or brush and create something new. So, and cooking is the same way and gardening and how people design their homes and spaces. It's all creative. So it's a thing, you know, when someone says, I'm not creative, I don't have a creative bone in my body. I, I always like to say, is that true? <laughs> I don't think that's true. Or maybe it's mm -hmm. something they need to nurture, you know? And one of my favorite sayings, um, I actually learned it from um, a nonprofit group that I'm in, uh, Ohio Can Change Addiction Now. And um, we always say mm -hmm. we rise by lifting others. We rise by lifting others. And, and I truly mm -hmm. believe that. Somewhere along the process, I, I got a little bogged down because I was holding too many people up and not yeah. nurturing myself. That's really what art has brought to me is that self nurturing and fulfillment because you know what? Yeah. You cannot pour. I agree. I was cup. just saying that to someone earlier today, you know, it, cause she was saying, I want to help someone, but I think it's going to hurt me. And I said, then you need to think about, yourself because it's not selfish to say if I give all of myself to other people I have nothing left for me you know so whatever nurtures your creativity mm -hmm. and makes you feel good about that part of yourself I think that we need to do it's part of self-care it's not selfish to say I want to paint a painting or I want to make something for myself if that is what's going to make you happy you know I agree with you Dawn I really do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this is really reminding me of this. 
I want to say it's like a tendency that um, we see a lot, especially in in women and, and mm-hmm. girls, you know, to really, you know, feel like they have to do things for other people and mm-hmm. really just give, give, give. And I think it can be really hard to like know mm-hmm. what's okay to let go of. And, you know, this might be a little bit of a sore subject, but I know that you had, you know, your job in the public schools as an art teacher, which I'm sure that was really hard for you to give up because you had this opportunity mm-hmm. to, you know, inspire. Yeah, and I loved people. my work with the public schools. And, but, you know, at the same time, I had 47 kids in my class. And, you know, I was expected to teach digital photography to 47 kids using six cameras and 29 computers. So I did it. (laughs) But should I have had to? (laughs) You know, that's that it's like a balancing act when you're a public school teacher because you don't have resources in most cases. You just don't have the resources. And especially, you know, I joked earlier that I was going to do I thought about teaching biology and I thought about teaching art and I picked art, but maybe I should have been a STEM teacher. You know, my, they don't lose their jobs every year. Like I did five years in a row. I got laid off every beginning of July. Mm. Well, maybe you'll have your job back and maybe you won't, you know? So that's the plight of the art teacher in Florida. But my sister Lynn also teaches chemistry (laughs) You know, so she's never had that problem. She's got a great job. She works up in the um, D.C. area and is very well treated. And, you know, it's a different environment for um, a science teacher Mm -hmm. than it is for an art teacher. So, you know, I loved my job, but I do Mm -hmm. I do um, look back on it and think, you know, 50 percent, 51 percent of it was awesome and amazing because I love the high school age. I was teaching AP art history and digital art. Um, Someone else had the ceramics class, but she did a good job. So that's fine. (laughs) Right. But, um, you know, it it was bittersweet when I left, but also I'm not dealing with all of the administration issues and challenges that face art teachers. So. Yeah. Yeah. I just. Yeah, it's kind of a double whammy because education in general um, seems to be a little bit Mm -hmm. uh, lower priority, if you will. It seems to be not. So, you know, I think it was probably really hard for you to choose yourself in that situation. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I had been building my business for a while and didn't really know what was going to happen, you know, because when you're building an art business, it's, um, when you build any business, really, if you get down to it, you don't know, there's no guarantee of success. Um, so you just have to have faith and move forward. And leaving the school board was like, you know, I know I'm doing an awesome job, I was on the staff development team. I was teaching teachers. I was getting my AP kids were were, um, graduating and getting their fives on their AP test at a rate higher than the national passing average. So I was doing a bang up job and I still have students who talk Mm. to me. And that was I quit teaching in 2013. Um, You know, some of my students are getting married and having kids and telling me about it. And it's amazing and awesome to have that connection with young people. And at the same time, yeah, it was, you know, the fifth year that I got laid off, I was like, you know what? This feels like a bad deal, (laughs) you know? So I'm not, I'm okay with leaving. I mean, I really did. It was a, it was a struggle. I took a, a leave of absence. I didn't just quit. I took a leave of absence, which Florida will allow you to do for a year And then when they sent me the paperwork that said, you know, you have a month to figure this out and decide if you're coming back, that was a month of challenge and struggle and thought and introspection. Mm -hmm. And I finally just decided Mm -hmm. to let it go. Yeah, it's so courageous. Mm -hmm. 
I, we, Lynn and I had this. Oops, Lynn and I had this discussion. I don't know a couple of weeks ago, Lynn, where we were talking about how you know there's tons of research coming out now showing how creativity um, mm-hmm. enhances brain function. It increases test scores. It it makes people better scientists, better whatever. But yet our school systems are plummeting in the funding for these programs. And even last week or whenever I went to that medical conference, I mean, I can't tell you how many seminars that I went to that they were talking about um, creativity and mindfulness. And they're doing tons of research in the government now about it. But yet we continue Uh to chop the funding for our kids. So it's a real, it's, it's maybe a cause that I feel called to, Uh you know, shed light on and who knows, maybe do something. It's been that way for years, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think a lot of people are really feeling called to that now. I mean, I think that's part of the success behind the creative life book. I mean, number one international bestseller in six countries, yeah. or are there more now? <laughs> and, five, five countries. <laughs> okay, five. Um, and then yeah. also in so many different categories, is it 23 or 25 different categories? I think people are really just craving this. And there are scientists now who are um, in, the, in the area of neuroesthetics that are really proving how important creativity is either by doing it, um, or appreciating it. Um, even, you know, dipping your toes into creativity yeah. one time per month can add years to your life. Yes, because it's so good for your mental health, which then translates to your physical mm-hmm. health. You know, the, um, I remember when I first got my job podcasting for the school board, uh, I was actually working in in this little division called Broward um, Virtual University, and it was professional development for teachers. And our program director was very um, strict and unimaginative, and someone in the and she was managing a group of artists <laughs> and writers, right? So we were all like going nuts behind the scenes because everything was so rigid and someone even printed off an article about creativity in the workplace. And this is 20 years ago, you know, where people were starting to say, if you stifle creativity in the workplace, you don't Mm -hmm. get good work. So we're not even just talking about kids in school. We're talking about like life skills, you know, creativity, ha- you have to be allowed even to think creatively and have your creativity expressed to be a whole and complete human. And I'm glad that science is starting to accept that and celebrate it. And that, and that is why we're doing this podcast also, you know, yes. to just really get people out there, you know. to to know more about it or to feel good about their creativity um, side hustle, if it is. Yeah. I mean, and then everything that you're creative about doesn't have to be turned into money. You know, it's just that, like I said, like you, you, Mm. someone once introduced me to a friend and he said, this is my friend, Kira. She expresses herself for a living. And I was like, Oh, wow. Like that is, I'm so glad you see me that way. I didn't mean, I wouldn't even have said that, you know, about myself, but yeah. Okay. I own it. Yes. I express myself for a living and I wish more people would just express themselves authentically and be okay with themselves and realize that if your creativity mm-hmm. is not art, you're still allowed to have it and be it and, express it because it's good for you. I love that so much. It's making me jump for joy, even though I'm sitting. That's going to be the intro clip. I thought so. Yeah. I was like, man, that's so good. It's so good and so true. Um, you know, after my husband's um, 
mom passed away. Mm -hmm. She was a knitter crocheter and she had this huge closet full of boxes and boxes mm -hmm. and boxes of yarn. And he took some of that yarn and he taught himself how mm -hmm. to knit and crochet. Oh. And he's made blankets for um, my grandkids, my daughter, my sons. Um, and mm -hmm. he loves to do that. He comes home and he goes into his uh -huh. little creative room That's and starts cool. knitting. <laughs> wow. And been so therapeutic for him, just like the mm -hmm. art has been for me. So I totally I would have get never it. guessed that. You're talking about <laughs> Barry, right? Barry I Bobet. am talking about Barry. Yes. <laughs> the, the football star. Yeah. Wow. He's a knitter and crocheter. Oh, cool. I love it. He needs to own yeah. it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. He does. That's own cool. it. He does. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> wow this has been such an awesome talk with you Kira I I have so many thoughts swirling around in my head and you know that is why you are an administrator <laughs> on our badass tribe because you know um, these ideas that you've come up with are fantastic mm -hmm. oh and oh, the, yeah. the card yeah. deck that we had yeah, I'm looking yeah. forward to we're gonna plan the planner for this year. And, you know, so if you're listening, you can get a High Vibe Art Tribe planner for 2024. Just follow these ladies and I'm sure they'll let you know when it's out. Um, and it's going to be amazing. We're just going to plan it better so that more people can have it. Right. Because sometimes, you know, flying by the seat of your pants is a great strategy when you're starting something new. And it allows you to be like super creative because you just can overflow with, well, what if I do this? And what if I try that? And then in that process, you can whittle down the creativity into like something manageable and do it again. And then it's experience that makes you better. So it's like being creative plus experience makes you on top of the world. So that's why I like doing things fast and doing them messy because then you can be the most creative, mm -hmm. right? Cause it doesn't even matter. So, yeah. What matters is that yeah. you did it. Yeah. And that's why, you know, I, I like to say done is better than perfect because so at least I did it and I learned something from it. And then you get to know if you feel like doing it again, you know, maybe sometime some things you don't have to do again once you did them. Mm -hmm. Some things you might have discovered that, you know, that creative impulse took you in a direction you couldn't have imagined. I actually always knew I wanted my own business, but if you had said to me 25 years ago that this is what I would be doing, I probably wouldn't have believed you, you know, because everything kind of went right. one to the other and became this big, beautiful business that I, that I run. Yeah. So I like it. I like just being open to the possibilities. Yeah, that makes sense. There's so many little lessons mm -hmm. along the way that we have to really mm -hmm. internalize. Yeah. yeah. Kira, thank you so much for these big collaborative projects that you're spearheading with the planner and the card deck. You're and welcome. Thank you so much for sharing your journey. Because um, mm -hmm. I remember one time when you were talking a little bit about yeah. one of the um, online uh things like Etsy that you were using. And then you kind of mentioned something about your sales that you have accumulated. I was just thinking like, what, how is that even possible? And now I see that it's <laughs> been just so much dedication and consistent effort and a lot of creativity mm -hmm. to be really um, uh, inventive basically. Yeah. And not giving up, you know, a lot of times I think that our right now it's easy to get into an instant gratification mindset because social media moves us so fast. And, you know, all of us women are of a, a certain age, right? So we didn't grow up with a computer in our pocket, but now we all have one. So I even find myself scrolling mindlessly and, and I have to stop. I'm like, what am I doing? I don't need 
all of this information overload. I need to now stop and go do something with it. So the, the concept of like sticking with something and realizing that it might not happen overnight and that it does take dedication, it does take daily action, you know, those are the things that help you to take all of that stuff that's in your head and like take action on it and get it into the world so that you can refine it and do, you know, add to it, take away from it. I mean, creativity is really the action of refining all of your ideas so that you can keep going with the ones you like and eliminate the ones you don't. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that's how I run my business. Yeah. If something doesn't work, I don't drop it the next day. I let it go till I can get some statistics and see if it really isn't working or if it's me that's not working. And, and I drop the things that I don't like and I do more of the things that work and that I do like. So and, I, and like you said, Dawn, you know, if something is not my skill set, I find someone to help me. So, you know, and that's another part of creativity, too, is like realizing that maybe something isn't your thing and being willing to reach out and find mm -hmm. those people that will help you. <laughs> so if you're like me. Want to jump on some of these things that Kara has shared today, please check out the link in the podcast bio because we're going to list all those things so you can find her, find some of her products and, and all the things that she has <laughs> to offer. And I, I know I'll be there. Uh -huh. I'll be and uh, please share this podcast with your friends. Give us a like. Give us a thumbs up, rate it. Um, we really appreciate you and we appreciate you, Kira, for everything that you do for us in the tribe and everything that Thanks, you've Dawn shared and with Lynn us today. for having me. It was great. It's been a pleasure talking yes, with you. Thank was. you so much. Mm -hmm.